The key is not equilibrium, but fluctuation. That's why the phrase creative destruction is so powerful. To turn crises into opportunities, period. Well, we're on the west coast of Canada on Vancouver Island, a place of stunning beauty and accessible wilderness. This is where Buzz Holling, the father of resilience theory, lives. Let's go see him and try to find out what resilience is all about. Whatever you do, the climate will change. There will be differences, and some of them will be very sudden. They can be viewed as crises, as demons coming out of the unknown. But in fact, what they are is opportunities for people to learn how to deal with and turn crisis into opportunity. Well done. He is, after all, the, the grandfather of resilience research. He's one of the major thinkers around global sustainability and has been involved for decades building up not only the theory around resilience, but also its application in policy and governance. There has to be an end to this self-fulfilling prophecy that generates a spiral of growth that we know can't go on forever. I think we have to mobilize a major effort to try to make science a servant to man. More than 30 years ago, Buzz Holling developed what was later known as the resilience theory. It referred to the capacity of a social ecological system to withstand shock and to rebuild and renew itself. An interesting theory, but perhaps confined to the academic world. Not at all. During recent years, Buzz Holling's work has not only influenced scientists, but also policymakers all over the world. One of the places where his ideas on resilience are applied are at the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, well known all over the world for coral reefs and magnificent marine life, and visited by two million people each year. But the reef was under threat, and in 2003, the Australian government had to take action. Our aim was to increase the resilience of the ecosystems in the reef. Uh, they were under threat from a number of pressures and we needed to reduce those pressures. Overfishing, runoff from land, toxic spill was the reason for drastic actions, which worked in surprisingly short time. Within three years, there was a threefold increase of top predator fish. It's been quite remarkable how quickly it's happened uh, and it shows the value of the no-take zones which mean that there is no exploitation of the sea and the ecosystem in that particular area. Our societies, our economic systems, work pretty much the same way that nature does, according to Buzz Holling and the resilience researchers. They're complex systems. We often fail to understand the complexity and are always surprised and shocked when the inevitable crises appear, like the worldwide financial crisis starting in the fall of 2008 a number of small steps are allowed to occur and nobody reacts on the information coming out of the slow variables of banking systems around the corner having problems but still we just allow a big major non-linear threshold to be crossed with a disastrous effect. Resilience is exactly about the same thing to understand that society's nature has these slow underlying variables such as air quality or freshwater availability or soils that keeps a system to cope with shocks and keeps them strong. Now, in the same way as the financial system was allowed to just trickle on with the tyranny of the small steps, resilience is about understanding these slow parameters which may be changing very slowly and we kind of don't perceive that anything is changing, but then suddenly you can have an abrupt threshold being crossed and a major, major shift. And the financial crisis is, is a good example when resilience theory was not applied. Resilience is structured around the acceptance of disturbance, even the generation of disturbance, and the production of variability. Have abrupt changes always been part of uh, ecological systems, or is it mainly something introduced by mankind? That's not the case, no. The whole history of living, of life on the planet, 
has been one of this dynamic change. And it occurred long before humans appeared. But humans did add something more. And that was basically in exploiting resources, reducing diversity, and in so doing, reducing the resilience of these systems. So the fluctuations that are normal still occur, but they are more limited. So you can get situations because of human interventions where the diversity has been so compromised that the fluctuation, rather than just uh, operating in a persistent region, flips the system somewhere else. He has a tremendous overview, a real systems thinker, who can think in dynamics in a way that most people don't do. Many people tend to go into details very much. Buzz Holling is interested not only in theories around resilience thinking, but also on the practical side of it. That's why Ian McGill invited him to be on the board of Ecotrust, a Canadian NGO. A friend of mine pointed out to me recently that Buzz had retired to Nanaimo, right here in the coastal rainforest where we do our work, and we couldn't resist coming and asking him if he'd be on the board, and he learned about our work and he agreed. Ecotrust Canada is focused on the natural environment and the Aboriginal people. We've been around here for a couple of hundred years. These communities have been here for 10,000 years and have withstood all number of changes, all number of shocks, all number of losses, and they're still here, they're still culturally strong. So we have a lot to learn from these communities, and I think fundamentally they are communities that exhibit all the characteristics of resilience. Buzz Holling started to develop his theories on resilience after doing systems research regarding predators and its prey. Yeah, that was fantastic work. It really was. It was an effort to develop a very deep and general understanding of predation that would apply to predators all the way from bacteria in the ocean to uh, lions in Africa to seals and fish, as you see here, a variety of animals. Uh, birds, uh, small mammals, insects, came up with this marvelous um, pattern, well, four models that explained all this. He says he thinks with his belly button. I don't know what he thinks with. Maybe it's magic, but he thinks, he imagines, he feels, and he comes up with the most amazing ideas over and over and over again. Then it became a, a critical point of uh, using those very well-tested, empirically-based uh, equations to simulate how populations of predators, seals, and populations of their prey, their fish, uh, interact. And I remember vividly the first run we made of the model the populations either were in one stable region where they fluctuated, or they were outside that region and one or other of them went extinct. This was a surprise to me. I didn't know that would happen. And it turned out when I looked at the, the equations, it, the explanation became clear. First of all, I concluded that uh, the multi-stable condition of ecological systems must be universal. And there wasn't a single equilibrium. There were multiple equilibria. And the populations could jump from one to another.